Welcome to Setting Course, an ABS podcast, where we're charting the future of the marine and offshore industries. I'm Brad Cox, and I'll be your host today. ABS recently launched the sixth edition of its Sustainability Outlook series. And beyond the horizon, carbon neutral fuel pathways and transformational technologies, ABS provides insight into, among other things, the future fuel mix, fleet dynamics, and energy efficiency technologies, all of which will play into potential net zero scenarios. You know, we're joined by a couple of guests from the ABS sustainability team to explore the outlook and its findings. Here with me in Houston is Sergio Stamopoulos, ABS Director of Global Sustainability and one of several contributors to this year's edition. Hello, everybody. And from the ABS office in Copenhagen, we have senior sustainability engineer Ushma Ahuja, who is one of ABS's secondees to the Maersk McKinney Moeller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Right. And thank you both for being on the episode today. So, Sturgios, we're going to go get started with you. You know, I know you've been involved in several of the outlooks over the last several years. Uh, You've seen how that big picture of net zero has evolved over time. Uh, what were the biggest takeaways from this year's edition? You know, were there any surprises? Thank you, Brad. Happy to be here, as Usma said. This year, this is the sixth outlook that we published, and we try to look uh, under the the umbrella of the new IMO net zero target. What are the elements that of the industry that will support or create challenges for this target? So some of the key takeaways that we found was that our previous predictions on the fuel mix and the decline in the use of the oil-based fuels is still valid. Actually, there is an accelerated decline of the oil-based fuels. We see the emergence and the growth year on year on the use of methanol and ammonia as fuels, we see the gradual increase of the LNG uh, usage. Uh, So this is as far as the fuel mix projection and the pathway to net zero. The outlook, of course, covered a lot of other elements relating to transformational technologies, relating to the offshore industry. The offshore industry is going also through its own transformation. So we looked at that element also. And what's interesting here to note is that with every passing year, we have new fuel types coming up. We have more information, more research being carried out about the emission factors. And this year, uh, we have particularly gathered all the information about well-to-wake scenario for a lot of fuel types. Uh, Now, well-to-wake scenario is a combination of uh, two factors, which is the downstream emissions, which are tank-to-wake, and the upstream emissions, which are well-to-tank. When you combine these two factors, you get the overall life cycle emissions of particular fuels. What's interesting to note here is a lot of the e-fuels, which are usually electronic green energy-based fuels, those have started to gain a lot of traction. And there has been a lot of research being carried out over there with new information coming up about energy usage and how we should select pathways depending on the amount of energy every fuel gives us as an output compared to what we input in the system. So that is also one of the big factors of the report and how we shed light onto how different fuel pathways perform. And if I may add, uh, Brad, one of the elements we also look at this year was, okay, everybody's talking about the alternative fuels and they need to decarbonize. But we wanted to look at the capacity of the of the industry to support this transformation. So when we're talking about the capacity, we're talking about the shipyard's capacity in terms of new builds, in terms of retrofits. So you do have a great number of vessels that they're still within the commercial stage of their life. So, and I'm, I'm sure Usma will talk about this later on during our conversation. So we looked at the, the capacity in both cases and if it can support the need to decarbonize as stipulated before. And with that, I think one other element which comes very nicely into the picture and is a big piece of the bigger puzzle is the shipyard capacity and how the existing fleet, which is operational at the moment, and it's young, they won't be reaching their end of life before we reach the 2050 target. How do we make sure the new builds that we have who do not stand a chance right now 
to meet the goals, meet the reduction targets? How can they be supported? How can they be retrofitted with a new technology, which is proving to be CAPEX intense at the moment? How do we make sure that that element is also something that we consider? So the shipyard capacity has also been discussed in the report in detail, and our experts have predicted Given the data, they have forecasted how much we lack right now in terms of availability, time slot, as well as the technology in general, because these are some of the new pilot features that we are talking about. Some of them have been tried and tested. Some of them are yet in the development phase of the new technology. What we need to make sure is we strike the right balance between picking up what was best for the fleet, depending on the kind of fleet we have depending on the kind of ship we are operating with and making sure that each of them get get a share of the overall mix. Sturgeo, you mentioned the the kind of the mix of fuels and where things are trending. How is this this fuel mix shaping the order book today? You know, what what ships are being built, you know, what what are they using, what are they burning? What's the near term outlook of what people are are ordering? Sure. Before I dive into the order book, going back a little bit and as a segue to the market outlook and linking it to what Uzma just previously said about the, the need for retrofit for a substantial number of vessels, is that this year we also look at a couple of scenarios, projections beyond the fuel. So the fuel mix up to 2050 is, as I said before, uh, we see significant growth on methane and ammonia. LNG is on a more stable growth path and the decline of oil-based fuels. But also we looked at three scenarios. One was the base case scenario where we forecasted, you know, it, it was more of a conservative look at, you know, having gradual improvements in emissions uh, reduction through, you know, the gradual adoption of dual fuel engines and energy efficiency technologies. And with that base case scenario, conservative as I previously mentioned, uh, we see that although uh, the industry will achieve the 2030 uh, IMO target, it is unlikely to meet the 70% reduction uh, target by 2040. So then we looked at two additional scenarios, what we call the net zero scenarios, uh, looking at what parameters will need to be, for a lack of better term, modified to actually the industry reach net zero. So one, you know, what we call the net zero scenario one, it's similar to the base case scenario previously mentioned with, you know, an even more accelerated adoption of new technologies and fuels, which still came to meet the 2040 targets, but was able to meet the net zero by 2050 target. The second scenario it described a more aggressive approach with a rapid fleet renewal and retrofitting trying to link that to what Usma said before about retrofitting and capacity, and trying to achieve a significant emission reduction to meet both the 2040 and 2050 target. So the net zero two scenario is uh, what we should be aiming for, uh, but that scenario relies on very quick development and availability of the, of the alternative fuels, the zero carbon fuels. So uh, going back to the actual question, uh, about what we see in the market right now. Uh, we see a, 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 a huge uptake uh, in new builds uh, of alternative fuels. Uh, if I recall correctly, 50% of the fleet currently in order in terms of uh, GT are dual fuel vessels. And I believe Usma can give you some more uh, numbers and trends on this. Absolutely. So the order book, as per 2024 April, we have 73% conventional fuel vessels. And compared to that, the alternate fuel number is low for now. We have 27% alternate fuel vessels in the market. Within the alternate fuel order book, we see LNG dominating at the moment which is closely followed by methanol as a fuel. The other fuel types such as ammonia or hydrogen or even biofuel, they're growing, they're rapidly getting there. However, they're not yet at a point of production where our fleet, our world fleet can operate on alternate fuel. We still need decent amount of LSFO, of conventional fuel, to fuel us towards the pathway to reduction. However, the technology that we're looking at right now, the availability, the scalability, that is a challenge in the sector. 
because we must remember that uh, shipping is also at par with other sectors. And we are fighting for fuel availability when it comes to airplane industry, road transport, and other areas. So shipping will not solely be getting the entire fuel mix that is being predicted. We'll have to fight our way into the fuel market and make sure that shipping gets what it has promised to deliver on and we move forward with the goal of decarbonizing things. So, you know, obviously we, we talk about all the, the alternative fuels, the, you know, the LNGs, methanols, ammonias, hydrogens and all that. But you know, is there any sort of wildcard fuel or energy source? You know, maybe we're talking nuclear, maybe we're talking electrification. Is there anything like that that's not really on the horizon, but, but maybe beyond the horizon? You know, what's, what's the next, next generation of, of shipping going to look like? I think Stegius will uh, agree with me that it will most probably be liquid hydrogen, which will be coming up and taking the industry by storm once it has been established. Liquid hydrogen as such is a very volatile kind of a fuel. Uh, We need to make sure that a fuel which has a potential of reducing our emissions by almost 80 to 90 percent, it needs to be safe for our crew. The new fuels that are popping up on the market, they right now lack the risk assessment, the comprehensive risk assessment that needs to be completed before we jump on to using them. We are progressing, yes. However, there are a lot of uncertainties in that domain. And I know uh, ABS for One is working with various uh, industry stakeholders to ensure that the new fuels that come up, for example, hydrogen or ammonia, they match up the standard to keep our crew safe. I will agree with Usma. Hydrogen is is the let's say the holy grail of the industry. It has certain challenges as a, a, a chemical molecule itself. But again, we need to look at the the whole decarbonization effort as a multi layer problem. There is the the issue with the fuels themselves, you know, their, their safety, their availability. And another technology that is on the table, uh, it's been around for quite a few decades, it's a nuclear component. With nuclear, the technology has greatly improved, much more safe. You have the, the modular nuclear reactors now in terms of size, in terms of safety are nothing compared to the past but again with the nuclear technology is the the public you know you need to change a little bit the public awareness but yes uh, there is a lot of movement on this field and uh, might be one of the solutions for the future and there's not going to be one solution we keep on saying that different segments different areas different you know ship types different trades they will end up finding their own way of meeting, you know, the net zero target. Certain areas, certain segments, certain trades might use ammonia, hydrogen, or nuclear, or electrification. So we will see these variances playing out pretty soon. Yeah. So of course, you know, energy efficiency technologies also have a a big role to play here in achieving net zero. You know, some of our past episodes, we've talked about wind-assisted propulsion, carbon capture, you know, autonomous functions, and how those all kind of fit into the equation. But, you know, a lot of those technologies are also at varying levels of readiness. So what technologies are seeing the most uptake now, and, and what are the trends for the near future for EETs? So, Brad, that's very interesting that you bring it up. Energy efficiency is one of the biggest stars which will aid us to reach our targets our net zero target. And let me tell you why, because if we switch fuels and we start using alternate fuels, what we are not doing is reducing the need to consume. What we are doing is simply switching uh, from one source of energy to the other. Energy efficiency is a very important factor because we need to figure out ways how we can reduce the need to use the fuels in the first place. How do we make sure that we save each and every bit of fuel and extract the most out of it? How do we make sure that the potential of the fuel that we are using is maximized, the output is maximized, at the same time, we use less of what is needed? Energy efficiency, along with alternate fuel uptake, is a very nice combination. We just need to find the perfect balance. We need to strike the perfect balance to reach the target. 
this will not only help us bring down our OPEX cost, but it will also help us bring down our CAPEX cost. Because if you look in the longer run, if we install a retrofit on a vessel, which is, let's say, two years old, three years old, five years old, the savings that we're going to get by reducing the amount of fuel that goes into that vessel for it to operate is ultimately going to come down. And that is what we aim for, because the reductions, they need to happen at source. And that is what energy efficiency technologies touch upon. So the total uh, fuel mix or the kind of fuels that we usually rely on, some of them have already been uh, developed and they are in production right now. However, what we are uh, lacking is the source and economic feasibility of switching to blue fuel. We need to look at carbon capture and storage as a very fundamental way of getting to the net zero target that we have. For in front of us. The carbon that can be stored, that can be stored on board, that in itself can prove to be a source of raw material for fuel. So energy efficiency technologies in totality have a very big impact on how we function right now and how the future is going to look like. Yes. And if I may add, is that this year we took actually a little bit more of a deeper dive on some of the, what we call key transformational technology. So uh, we looked at the onboard carbon capture uh, systems and their role in being a viable solution for reducing emissions on sea. So again, this, you know, onboard carbon capture is still in its uh, early stages, but we see a lot of research and interest and pilot studies and projects being conducted right now. It can support decarbonization. It can achieve up to 80% or higher uh, rates of capturing carbon or emissions on board, but it has its own challenges. It will require a higher amount of energy and equipment. There are different pathways of carbon capture that are currently explored with each one with their own benefits and challenges, for example, post-combustion, pre-combustion, and so on. Uh, another transformational technology that we've seen recently the industry looking at and exploring is uh, wind assistant propulsion. So it is evolving as a technology. It harnesses the wind power to aid, to aid traditional ship engines, providing you know, more economic environmental benefits. Uh, there are different types of wind assistant propulsion out there. One of the things that um, recently come into view is that the wind assistant propulsion systems offer benefits under the, the new European Union regulation, both the EU ETS and the fuel EU uh, maritime regulation. And wind assistant propulsion can assist in reducing onboard the fuel consumption, which in the context of EU ETS, has a direct effect on the compliance cost uh, as less fuel consumed results in less tax emissions. And an additional benefit under the fuel EU maritime is the potential of uh, wind assistant propulsion to provide 5% reduction on the greenhouse gas intensity calculation of energy used on board for those vessels where wind propulsion accounts for 15% or more of the energy used for propulsion. So these two technologies are something that the industry is looking at. In addition to what we call in ABS beyond the engine, technologies where we're talking about nuclear, we're talking about fuel cells, hybrid propulsion systems, which they also contribute, you know, in the efforts of the industry. So it's it's already been mentioned, you know, about the the shipyard capacity. You know, you know all these new ships, new engines, new technologies. They've got to be built somewhere, uh, and there's only so much shipyard capacity around the globe. So, you know, how will retrofitting factor into hitting 2030 goals? And is there enough retrofitting capacity to even do so? The way that the industry looks right now, uh, we have two major players in the world who are the leaders in shipyard capacity and how they make sure that the world demands are met. One of them is China, and China has always been very big on the amount of gross tonnage they can handle when it comes to shipyard capacity. And following them closely is South Korea. Now, these two countries, they are handling such a big load of the entire global industry, the maritime industry, that at a point of time, 
if we do not expand our shipyard capacity, it might end up being difficult for us to reach the goals that we intend to. One of the other things to note over here is that retrofitting a ship is not as easy as it sounds. If you think about it, it's already a floating entity. All we need to do is do a bit of makeup on it, try to dress it up very nicely, and then off it goes, ship it away. However, that is not the case. It is a complex situation. A yard's ability to design and execute a holistic fuel retrofit is dictated by a range of factors that it requires highly skilled workforce, which includes naval architects and experienced electrical engineers. And also, the ability to handle it safely and make sure the retrofit engine, if it is done for alternate fuel types, it is done in a safe and sound manner. And we have all expertise around us to make sure it becomes a success. Due to these reasons and these peculiar situations, it becomes harder for shipyards to make sure that retrofit projects take as much precedence as new builds. That's why shipyards usually prefer going for a new build project rather than retrofit. And if I may expand a little bit on Uzma's uh, uh, comments uh, within you know, this year's uh, outlook, we did an analysis looking at the yard's capacity in terms of fuel retro. So uh, what we found is that only a small number of shipyards currently can undertake fuel retrofits, mainly for the reasons that Uzma has stated. That analysis uh, is around uh, 50 shipyards. Based on this, it is expected that the current available capacity will be exceeded in 2027, when the demand for retrofits from the existing fleet will be well underway. So we projected that additional demand for retrofits will be added to the mix for also from the new vessels that are currently being delivered. So it is important to note that um, uh, when the fuel retrofit option gains traction, the number of, the yard, of yards capable of completing the demanding and complex fuel retrofits will increase, and thus we expect that additional capacity will be provided. So we're looking at a very dynamic uh, sector uh, with new players coming in from countries expanding and improving their shipyards uh, that focus on retrofits. Right, and, and Ushma, I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, ships built today will be 25, 26 years old in 2050. So, you know, when we get around to 2050, you know, will retrofitting still be a factor by then? Or are we looking at a whole new wave of, of ships with even newer technologies? You know, obviously technology develops fast. So, you know, what are we looking at come 2050? That is a difficult question to answer, partly because right now we are lacking the regulation. We do not know what is to come while we go along. The IMO is coming up with regulations year in, year out. So while we follow the path towards uh, decarbonization, we are also thrown uh, many challenges along the way. What is interesting to note is, in an ideal scenario, we'll be having a complete fleet of new vessels sailing on the uh, best fuel possible with zero emission. However, as you said, the, as technology advances, as we make advancements in new fuel types, in how to incorporate those new fuel types into an already existing vessel, it might become difficult to get them retrofit once they are already uh, halfway through their life. So it's important that we remember that when a vessel is built, it will last us 25 years. Do we invest in something which will give us results, which will help us meet the target, which will help us meet compliance now? Or do we wait five to 10 years down the lane and wait for the industry to mature to look for other options? That would be, of course, based on a company's strategic decision. However, in an ideal scenario, I would say we'll be looking at a, a fleet which runs solely on uh, zero emission fuel sailing towards a better future. So as uh, you know, we get near the end of our episode, you don't want to open things up for any closing thoughts you two might have. You know, are there any other big trends we haven't discussed uh, or, you know, what's the one big key to reaching net zero? Yes, Brad. So the key takeaways from this year's outlook uh, is mainly the increased and accelerated need 
for certain alternative fuels, uh, LNG, methanol, uh, ammonia. This is uh, clearly indicated in the uh, order book that will, man you know, that will you know, provide an illustration or a vision of how the, the shipping industry and the fleet will look like in the next 20, 25 years. New technologies are coming up, technologies and propulsion or power methods that previously were not discussed, for example, the nuclear element. Again, the transformation is highlighted by shift from the traditional fuel cells. This is an element that we have identified several years now from fossil fuels to more, you know, alternative, less carbon intensive fuels, uh, as the availability and production of those fuels become bigger, then that availability will feed the demand from the industry. One element that we also need to highlight is that the, this global energy transition effort gives rise to the need for the transportation of these new energy, let's say carriers or molecules. So marine routes link uh, regions with high demand for clean energy sources, such as ammonia and hydrogen in the near future, to production centers of alternative fuels. The trading of those new energy sources is going to be a big component as we move into the 2030s and the 2040s. And I can also echo here with uh, Sergius, because with MEPC 82 coming up, a lot of attention is uh, being diverted into alternate fuels, how, how we shape the midterm measures, how do we make sure that the intensity of the fuel is met on an annual basis and our fleet is compliant. And in, within all of these sectors, it is important to understand that measures can be complementary. We need to make sure that the decisions that are taken in today's day and age, they will last us till 2050. They will aid us in the development of technology and research, which will guide us towards the net zero target. It has to be complementary also in the sense that the cost gap analysis for the industry it, it gets easier for us to reach the target by making smart investments, by making smart choices, by forecasting what is uh, out there in the industry, what we are missing, what the gaps are, and addressing them point blank, making sure that we ask the right questions. And I think Outlook, the uh, newly published Outlook, is a very big answer to a lot of the ifs and buts that we have in the industry right now, because we give answers, we give clear-cut values, we give graphics, we let the industry know what we have found when we have went inside and taken a deeper look as to what is present and consolidated all that information. Okay, great. Uh, well, Sturgios, Ushma, uh, thank you both for joining me for the show. It was very insightful. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Sturgios. And for everybody listening in, you know, thank you for joining us. If you like this episode, leave a review, share it with your colleagues, and give us a follow. You can download the latest edition of the Outlook at www.eagle.org slash 2024 Outlook. Thank you for listening. <laughs>